Well, on behalf of the family of Mrs. Marion Scolton, I'd like to welcome uh, each and every one of you here this afternoon and uh, say a great big thank you from them uh, to all of you uh, just for being here today, for taking time out on your Saturday to support the family, to encourage them. I know they truly appreciate that, and it's wonderful to be able to be together uh, as family and friends. Today, obviously, we gather together for a, a very specific reason. Certainly, we want to remember and reflect uh, upon a life well-lived, but we're also here, and even mostly here, uh, to worship our God together. God, who is a God of grace, a God of love, a God of mercy, a God who is faithful. And even as we look at, what, five or six pews there full of family, we can see that faithfulness with even our eyes as we look at that. So it's a wonderful thing to be able to gather in God's presence and to rejoice in what he has given, even as we remember uh, a life and a person who has gone on uh, to be with her Lord and Savior in a way that, for us left behind, we can even only imagine. So again, welcome uh, to each and every one of you. So we enter into our, our time together uh, this afternoon. I'd like to share uh, a scripture, a couple of scriptures actually, that I hope will just kind of set the tone uh, for our time together this afternoon. I want to begin with one that is well known, and that is Psalm 23. And here the psalmist, David, writes, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And then I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Even as those words are close to our hearts today, they were close to the hearts of those in Israel. And Jesus knew those words well, too. And in fact, Jesus himself, he appropriated these words. He took them upon himself. And this is what he says in John chapter 10. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus continues, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. That's Jesus reminding all of us of who he is, that he is God in the flesh, that he is the Savior, he is the Messiah. And this is the Jesus that meant so much to Mary. And that's why we gather here today. And that's why we're here with a spirit of sadness, but also a spirit of joy. And as I sat on that front bench, I looked at the banner here, right? To my right, your left, the victories won. And that is so true. Would you join me in prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to gather here, to be in this place with family and friends. Father, mostly to be here to remember, to reflect, and to rejoice in a life well lived, a life in which you showered your grace, and your mercy, and your faithfulness. We are so very thankful for Marian. Dear mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, and friend. Father, we pray that as we reflect on this life today, that, Lord, you would fill our hearts with good memories. 
that you would allow us to share in the stories that will be told, but that mostly you would lift our eyes to you, that we would see you and your grace so very clearly, and the hope that you have for us in Jesus the Savior. So, Father, we do ask for a blessing on our time together today. We pray that for each one of us, you would speak to us as we need to be spoken to, that you would give to us, each one of us, what we stand in need of. And that, Father, at the end of this service today, our hearts would be full, full of your love and full of the knowledge of your grace. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. I'm going to take just a moment and read the obituary for Mrs. Marion Skolton. Marion Ruth, the child of God, entered into the arms of Jesus on Tuesday, March 9, 2021, at the age of 91. Marion was a member of Grafstadt Christian Reformed Church and former member of the Christian School Circle and Ladies' Aid Society. She and her husband Harvey owned and operated the Rivulet Hurst dairy and restaurant. Marion was preceded in death by her husband Harvey and also their daughter Linda Wienhoff. Marion is survived by her children Don and Ruth Scolton, Marcia and Tom Veltman, Clyde and Tony Scolton, Denny and Maureen Scolton, Carrie and Tom Dykeis, all of Holland, 17 grandchildren, 32 great-grandchildren, son-in-law David Wienhoff of Granville, in-laws Estella, excuse me, Estella Lammer of Zeeland, Henrietta Van Leer of Holland, Vaughn and Norma Jensen of Jackson, and many nieces and nephews. As I mentioned, even in just a, a few words there, and as we see in these pews, what a, a testimony to God's faithfulness and the fact that his mercies really are new every morning. Marion loved music. I think that is more than fair to say. And uh, we've heard some of that music already. Uh, granddaughter Renee has been at the piano. Dave Wiemhoff just played his trumpet for us. And uh, we're going to hear also now from a daughter, Carrie, who's going to share some special music with us. And this song is titled Ivory Palace.
Thank you, Carrie. We're here in great measure today to be reminded once again, particularly if we are a believer in Jesus, of that great hope we have in him and the promises that God gives. And one of the ways we do that is just by listening to his word. And so I'd like to share just a, a few passages from the New Testament. And I'm not going to comment on them. I just invite you to listen and allow the truth of what is declared here to settle into your soul and speak to you the way that God wants uh, to speak to you today. So to begin with from Romans chapter 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died. More than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Then from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, these words from Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God and he will be my son. God's word to his people, to speak to our hearts, to encourage us, to remind us today of all of his promises and the reality that he is so very, very good to his people. We have the opportunity right now to hear some reflections that the family is going to share. 
Nikki is going to share some of those, some of her own, and some, I think, from a couple others in the family. So, Nikki, come on. Nikki, by the way, is a, a granddaughter, a daughter of Clyde and, and Tony. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to celebrate the life of Marian Skolton. My name is Nikki Ellerbrook. As Phil just said, I am Marian's granddaughter. Grandma taught me the power of prayer, the importance of faith, family, and love. I will cherish every moment we've shared together. Our trips to Florida, her fresh squeezed orange and grapefruit juice from the trees out back, our nightly bowl of ice cream before we cozied up and to sleep in our favorite spot out on the front porch as the Florida rain would pitter-patter against the screens. Our ventures to Disney and our repeated rides on It's a Small World that was Grandpa's favorite. Those memories bring me so much joy. Perhaps the greatest memory I have is when I had the opportunity to interview Grandma for a project. We sat at the condo's dining table, sipping on hot chai tea, and talked all day long. My eyes were open to more than this beautiful woman whom I called Grandma, but to the amazing being the Lord has graced this earth with for the past 91 years. Marion Ruth Kleiss was born at 25 State Street on Shoemaker Hill in Zeeland, Michigan on October 22, 1929. She told me she inherited her mother, Hattie's personality and looks, and her father, Henry's brains, especially math. Marion loved to read. She said, the Bible is the most important book. You learn the stories when you're young, and they influence your life. Growing up in Zealand, Marion and her family were members of the Second Reformed Church, where she attended Sunday school and catechism. She received perfect attendance for eight years straight, earning a, p a pin for each year. Faith in Christianity had guided much of my life. She attended Zealand High School and was involved in National Honor Society, forensics, school plays, and sang for the Lord in churches and nursing homes. In 1946, her boyfriend Harvey returned from serving the Army. He asked both of Marian's parents permission to marry her, which she said was uncommon at the time. They were married at, in 1948 on Marian's 18th birthday. Marian and Harvey began married life on the homestead, where they remained for about 15 years. They loved the Lord fiercely. With him as their foundation, they raised six children, 17 grandchildren, and 32 great-grandchildren. They attended this very church, Grasscup CRC, where each of their children was baptized and made their profession of faith. On January 16, 1961, the dairy equipment from the homestead was moved to 788 Lincoln Building. A few years later, the Sultans opened up a takeout store in the front of the building selling milk and ice cream. The store expanded several times and became a full restaurant, serving all meals and a dinner buffet. In 1966, Revlin Hearst became incorporated. At one point, Revlin Hearst was the only dairy processing milk in the area. Marion remembered, when we had questions about things, we would pray hard and we would be shown clearly by the Lord which way to go. In 1985, Harv and Marion made the decision to sell to Barman Dairy. During the 80s, they purchased their double-wide home in Fort Myers, Florida. They enjoyed their winters there, their Florida church, and Florida friends. In the early 2000s, Harv and Marion faced Harv's onset of Alzheimer's disease. They made each decision through faith and prayer. Marion said, our greatest joy, especially during this time of personal crisis, was our children and our grandchildren. They have been really good to us. After Harvey went to the Lord, Marion continued to live a life built in Jesus. She lived independently, was active, 
loved gathering with her friends in her apartment's common area and would stroll to Captain Sunday's for a tasty treat. I'd sometimes be driving past her as her and her friends would be strolling down 40th Street, totally disregarding traffic. <laughs> she continued to live her life as God intended, full of faith and love that she shared with everyone that had the privilege of meeting her. Grandma loved her family. Her smile would light up a room each time she held a new grandchild. She knit a new Christmas stocking and a beautiful blanket for each child. Her granddaughter, Leslie, remembers the time and that she devoted and the patience she had for her great-grandchildren, watching them take turns, climbing over her walker, and going for rides as Grandma pushed them. Leslie also shared, I had no idea that cheese came in a cylinder shape until Grandma pulled it out of the fridge and sliced it. We had cheese slices on bran muffins that day for a mid-morning snack. Her granddaughter, Tammy, shared one of her favorite memories. Grandma and Grandpa came to visit them in Boulder about 18 years ago. Tammy remembers when they showed up to our apartment, they decided not to get a hotel room the night before and slept in their car at the rest stop. <laughs> Then they planned on heading into the mountains for a scenic drive after church. And as it was a Sunday, Tammy was putting together food for a picnic. Grandma asked what she was doing and she replied that it was Sunday. And Grandma replied, oh Tammy, we can just eat at a restaurant. They, Grandma just smiled and they ate at a restaurant in Estes Park. Marion's granddaughter, Sandy, remembers spending the night at Grandma and Grandpa's condo and sitting on the couch basement. Grandma and Grandpa reclined back in their chairs with the news on, falling asleep, and sitting there, giggling, listening to them snore. It was such a chorus. Sandy also remembers the visits to Florida. Grandma almost always had a puzzle she was working on, and she remembers helping her with them. Grandma always had the most beautiful plants. Her granddaughter Kim remembers the orchids and says she could grow anything. It's true, both the condo and the trailer had gorgeous flowers. Grandma also had my favorite lawn ornament, which was the little Dutch boy and little Dutch girl that would kiss him in the front of the trailer in Florida. While sipping on our chai tea that sunny day, Grandma shared, I am happy that I have had as good of a life as I have had. She expressed to me that whenever the Lord saw fit to call her home, she was ready. Grandma shared her advice to the younger generations. Trust in the Lord, he will carry you through. Grandma, thank you for sharing your faith, love, and wisdom. Until we meet again in paradise, we love you. Thanks, Nikki. And all those who contributed to that, enjoy that. This was just given to me, and uh, this uh, is from Marcia. And she would like me to read this for all of us here today. It's a letter to Mom. Dear Mom, you know that I'm not a, a speaker or a writer, but I just want to say thank you for all you did for us. Thank you, first of all, for being a, a wonderful Christian mother and raising us in a Christian environment where we could learn uh, how to be Christian children, uh, loving and serving our God. Thank you, Mom, for all the prayers offered for each of us kids as we grew up and got married and had children and grandchildren. I'm sure each one will always remember with love you as a mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother. 
The children always love to have grandma or great grandma at school programs and sports and all the birthday parties and other activities. Thank you, Mom, for letting your light shine for Jesus in all you did. I also want to say thank you for raising us to know how to work. Most people think of you as working in the office, but I know there were different times you had to come in and open the restaurant at five in the morning and cook for a while. I know that was not your favorite thing, but you did it anyway. I also remember what we did around at 3.30 in the afternoon most every day. We would sit in the booth and work on schedules and go over guest checks. The best part was that we always had a little snack between you loving sweets and dad and his ice cream, Marcia says, I know where I got my sweet tooth. Years later, when dad was in the nursing home, we would uh, go there after I was done working, and watch TV, play some games or do puzzles. Uh, we would find him supper, and then go back to his room and read the Bible and sing songs. Before bedtime, they all came around with a snack or ice cream after you stopped driving, we would uh, go for groceries on Friday afternoon. After the groceries were put away, we always uh, had a flavored glass of milk and a, a little bar or cheesecake that you bought at the grocery store. On Wednesday, when we... Sorry, I'm getting here. On Wednesday, when we had knit club, that's right, when we had knit club, uh, we would go for, for lunch at Evergreen Commons. Uh, we would split a sandwich, so we always had room for a piece of pie. We loved our snacks. I didn't have much of a, a green thumb. Uh, every year, when you and Dad would leave for Florida, I would get all your beautiful African uh, violets, but you could always count on having a few less when you got home. After I retired, uh, you thought I would be bored, so you decided I needed to learn how to knit on the knitting machine. You didn't know what a job that was going to be. Uh, you had so much patience with me. You would show me how to do something, uh, but I just couldn't make my fingers and thread do the right thing. So we would start over again. My husband would say, if this uh, is supposed to be relaxing, you couldn't convince me. The machines were made by Brother Company, so Tom said they should be called Old Brother. <laughs> but you were so patient with me that now I can use the one machine pretty good, and the ladies at Knit Club call me the hat lady. Mom's next mission was to teach me to use the computer to program designs in things. I know nothing about computers or tablets, but Mom says you can learn this before. Uh, you, you can learn this. Uh, before mom uh, felt, excuse me, before mom uh, fell, she was trying to teach me how to put in a design on the computer for Christmas stockings. Uh, I can do the punch cards for the one machine, but I haven't learned the computer yet. Hopefully someday someone will have as much patience as you had with me, and I will learn. Mom, I have your tablet, and I'm going to try to learn that. Thank you, Mom, for all your patience with me. But more than that, thank you for being my mom and able to spend so much time together. Thank you to Tom also for allowing me to do this. Thank you for all the wonderful memories we have. I'm so thankful that I know you're in heaven with Jesus and Dad and Linda. It is with tears in my eyes and a heavy heart that I say goodbye. I will truly miss you, Mom. Love always, your daughter, Marcia. Carrie's got another special music number for us. This one softly and tenderly.
Carey, and Renee too on the piano. Thank you for that. Well, as the basis of a, a short meditation I'd like to share with us today, I'm going to be reading from the book of Psalms, Psalm 25, verses 1 through 7. And if you happen to have that little brochure that was handed to you as you came in, the words are there too. You can follow along if you would like. Again, Psalm 25, 1 through 7. And here God's word tells us. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me. For you, O Lord, are good. As far as we want to read in God's word, we trust that he'll bless that word to each of us today. Well, family and friends, as uh, most of us know very well, life is full of firsts. We've got a first day of school. First date, maybe a first kiss, and the list literally goes on and on. And today I just want to tell you that uh, this is a, a first for me. I have uh, been a pastor now in the Christian Reformed Church for about 23 years, and in that time, rather surprisingly, I have never ever done a funeral for a relative. Uh, I've done a few weddings for relatives, uh, some even in an emergency state. Uh, so I've done that, uh, but never a funeral. Uh, not for this side of the family, not for the other side of my wife's family, and uh, not even for my own family. Uh, so this is kind of a first for me. Uh, and to be perfectly honest, when, when I took the call that was extended me to Graf Stop about uh, a little over a year and a half ago or so, I did so knowing a couple of things. Number one, knowing that I had some uh, immediate family in law here at the church, uh, obviously, but I also did so knowing that, that grandma uh, was getting up there in years, and uh, I also did so kind of hoping she would kind of outlive my, my tenure here. Uh, not because uh, what I get to do today uh, is something I wouldn't want to do. In fact, it's a great privilege uh, to be here and to officiate uh, this, uh, this service today. But because I feel there's a little bit more pressure, uh, just with all of these familiar faces staring back at me. So it's kind of good that I can only see half your face, because everybody's got the masks on today. But you know, I, I did have the opportunity to know Marion for uh, about 25 years, ever since uh, Renee and I uh, started dating. But even so, obviously I do not have the history with Marion that many of you have. Certainly that includes those in the front row here, uh, all of uh, Harvey and Marion's kids. Uh, but it includes many of you uh, also scattered and seated throughout the sanctuary today. You, you knew Marion for much of her life. But that said, I, I did get to know her as much as an in-law could anyway. Uh, I still uh, remember the first time that, uh, or around the first time, certainly, that uh, I met Harvey and, and Marion. Again, it was uh, when Renee and I were, were dating. And uh, they, they were very, very kind, as you can imagine. Uh, but I have to admit that I was a little bit more intimidated by Marion. Uh, Harvey was just kind of a smiley guy. Uh, but, 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 you know, Marion, I was a little bit more intimidated by, and maybe some of you other in-laws there, you know what I'm talking about. But, uh, but eventually, and, and rather shortly, everything warmed up, and especially after Renee and I got engaged, uh, then I, I felt completely welcomed. And after I, I married into the family, uh, I got my seat at the table, as it were, right? I, I got my Christmas stocking, for one, and, and then I got my annual snow baby. 
right? I can't believe Nikki didn't mention the snow babies, right? You can ask anybody about that later. Then I think I really arrived uh, when I did get the call from Grafskopf to be the, the senior pastor here, and of course they had to take a vote on that. And I'm pretty certain that Marion voted for me to come, right? Can I say that? All right, good. I, I, was, I was hoping that that was the case. So then I knew I'd kind of arrived. But I did get to know her uh, over the course of some 25 years or so. And the person that I got to know uh, was a pretty neat lady. We've heard a lot about that already. But uh, I just had a chance to reflect on it, too, in preparation for for our time together th this afternoon. And it struck me that as I interacted with Marion, that what rose to the top in my interaction with her was there were three main things that were really, really important to Marion. You could probably sit there and guess what they were. We we've heard echoes of them already today and what's been shared. But, but the first thing truly was family. And Nikki, you really hit hard on that. And you're absolutely right because Family was of utmost importance to Marion. There was just no doubt about that. Harvey and, and Marion, they, they loved their family. They enjoyed their family, their kids certainly, uh, all of their grandkids, all of their great-grandkids. I mean, family was just always very central uh, to Marion's life. And, and I've heard stories through the years, and Nikki, you touched on this a little bit, stories uh, about family vacations, right, as the kids were growing up. Uh, stories of trips in a motor home, visits to, to Fort Myers, Florida, all of these things. And, and all of those stories always told it with a smile. Family Christmas parties, right? We certainly have to mention that. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, Marion loved those times uh, getting together, especially in the past few years. And of course, she wasn't very mobile anymore, but after supper, we get in the circle and and she would just kind of sit back and watch, right? And especially as the great grandkids uh, got to open their presents, what they got from great grandma, and come up and thank her and give her a hug. And, and I can imagine she would just kind of sit back and, and marvel at this, this gift that God had given to her. So obviously family, uh, one of the foremost things that was so important to Marion. Friends were also really important to Marion as well. In fact, in the time that I've, I've been here at, at this church, I've had the chance to uh, interact with some of the, uh, the older members of this congregation. And when they find out that I'm, a, I'm an in-law to the Stolten clan and, and so forth, oh, I, we know Harvey and Mary, and we used to pal around with them years and years ago, and we would do this and we would do that. And, you know, some of those friendships would go back 60 years, some of them even more than that. But I guess when you spend over nine decades in one community, then you have ample time to make some pretty significant friendships, some pretty meaningful and deep friendships as well. And, and Marion certainly enjoyed those, even well into her retirement years. Uh, friends were just really important to her. She treasured those friendships. That was more than obvious. But the one thing that always stood out to me about Marion more than anything, the one thing that was undoubtedly the most important thing to her was her faith. I mean, family and friends were, were a huge part of her life. There's no doubt about that. But her life itself was defined by her faith. And that was a faith that she was never ashamed of. It was a faith that was always a priority for her, which was reflected in a variety of different ways, right? From faithful attendance at Sunday worship to, uh, to serving in so many different ways in, in the life of the church down through the years, from going to Bible studies to practicing personal devotions. Marion's faith was consistently in the forefront. So if you knew Marion, then you knew that she was a Christian. If you knew Marion, then you knew that she believed in Jesus as her Savior and her Lord. And along those lines, then, there would have been really almost endless possibilities for us with respect to a, to a text to focus our attention on for just a little while this afternoon. And even before Marion passed away, toward the end, when it became clear that she was failing, and this time that she, 
it didn't seem as though she was going to rebound. I had a variety of passages that were running through my, my mind, a variety of possibilities, as it were, when it came to this time here this afternoon. But then came last Tuesday. And last Tuesday, Renee and I went up to the hospital. We were going to visit Grandma. Um, because of the whole COVID thing and the restrictions on visitors, uh, Renee couldn't go in. I could because I'm clergy. I, I don't count, I guess, in that respect. So I went back there first. Marcia and Tom were in the room. And they asked if I would read the first seven verses of Psalm 25. Because as they told me, this was Marion's favorite passage. It, and it kind of surprised me. Right? It's just kind of a random text, I felt, uh, to be a favorite. Right? It's not something like Psalm 23 or John 3.16 or something like that. It's just kind of a, a random text. And it struck me that that was another thing I didn't realize before that Marion and I kind of had in common. Our favorite texts are just kind of random. Right? And mine is Job 19, verse 25. You, you could look it up later. So we did that. We, we read Psalm 25, 1 through 7. And then we prayed together. And later on, when I, when I left that hospital room, I knew that this was the text that I wanted us to think about, that I wanted to share when this day would come. So Psalm 25 is a psalm of David. And he is arguably the most talented songwriter in the book of Psalms. Certainly he is the most prolific and the first seven verses here are particularly captivating because of how they express such a need for God, right? especially in light of suffering and sin. And that right away tells me that Marion, just like David, she was a realist. Right? She knew that she did not deserve God's favor. She knew that she was in no position whatsoever to demand God's love. Bottom line is, she knew that she was a sinner. And she knew that it was that sin in her life, not to mention the sin that exists in the world around us, that sin which produces such suffering. She knew it was that sin that separated her from God, a God whom she could not live without. And it was exactly the same for David. And that's exactly why there are so many, so many cries out in this psalm. Cries, for example, for God to, to show and cries for him to teach and to guide and to remember. Because ultimately, all of these cries are for God to save. There's a key word in these opening seven verses that we might miss if we don't pay really close attention you probably didn't even catch it when I read those verses just a few minutes ago. That word is hope. It's there in verses 3 and 5. And David declares in verse 3, No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. And in verse 5 he says, You are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. These are verses that resonate with the gospel. And it's a gospel that in David's day and age, he did not have the privilege of knowing the fullness of as we know it today. But it's a gospel that nevertheless is echoed in David's prophetic words. Because the gospel as we know it, the good news of Jesus Christ, that by grace through faith in him, our sins are forgiven and our eternities secured. That gospel centers on hope. Because you see, hope is really the heartbeat of the gospel. And it's a hope that's not a, not a cross your fingers, kind of wishful thinking kind of thing. It's a hope that is sure and certain. It is a hope that is rooted in the reality of the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's a hope that's rooted in that reality of the cross and the empty tomb. It is a hope that knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that when we trust in Jesus, the crucified and risen Jesus. 
then we have salvation. Then we are saved. Then he has reached out and he has grabbed us. He has rescued us. He has redeemed us. He has delivered us. He has saved us. Because he's good. That was the essence of Marian's faith. That was the faith that defined her life. And you know, that is exactly why we can all gather here today. And yes, we're saddened by the loss that we've all experienced. But we can rejoice. We truly can rejoice. Because we know that right now, Marion is experiencing the presence of God in the face of Christ. And that she will live for all eternity. Even into the new heaven. And the new earth, when Jesus comes again. <coughs> Family, friends, and faith. What's important to you? I would imagine that family and friends most certainly are important. What about faith in Jesus? Is your life also defined by that faith as Marian's most certainly was? And I pray that it is. Because listen closely, if it's not, then you're not really living life. You're just sleepwalking. That's the truth. And if there's one thing that Marian would want for each and every one of us, no matter who we are, is that we have that same living faith in Jesus as our Savior. Maybe taking that step would be a first for you today. If so, that would be absolutely wonderful. Nothing would make Marion happier. And nothing would please God more. Father in heaven, how thankful we are for this life of Mary and Sultan that you've blessed us with. And the opportunity we've had today to remember that life. To reflect on that life. To rejoice in that life. And to listen to stories and to smile and even to laugh. But God, how good it is to be able to know that that although Marion isn't with us anymore, that she is with you. That she is in the arms of Jesus. That she is experiencing the very presence of God in the face of Christ himself. It's a marvelous thing. God, we thank you for the promises of your word. We thank you for the hope of the gospel. The gospel that David, even so many years before Jesus arrived on planet Earth, that gospel that that David even declared, that hope in Jesus. Father, it's because of that hope that we can have great confidence today. That we can even have a spirit of joy knowing that Marion is and always will be with you, that she is healthy and whole, she is safe and sound. And to be reminded again, even as we saw so very clearly in Marion's life, the importance of faith 
to be reminded how important that is to be in our lives too. Now, Father, if we don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord, that we're really not living at all. So, Father, if there's a first step to be taken by some today to, to establish or, or, or reestablish or reignite a relationship with you through Jesus Christ, that that would happen. We know that that would make you so happy. We know it would make Mary happy. Father, again, thank you. Thank you for this, this wonderful mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother. For a wonderful friend that, that you've given. Father, we pray that you would continue to grant each one of us the comfort and the peace that we need today. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Well, together as family and friends, we'd like to share a, a statement of faith. We're going to use uh, Heidelberg Catechism question and answer number one. And those words are, are there on the screen uh, behind me. I'd like to invite you to stand. Would you stand together? I'll read the words in white, uh, which is the question. And let's respond together with the words we see in yellow. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. I invite you to remain standing. We're going to close uh, our time here together this afternoon by singing By the Sea of Crystal. The words will be there on the screen and behind me. And just to note that following uh, that song, if you would just have a seat again, and, and you'll be released uh, row by row. But right before we sing, God wants to give us his, his blessing. And I just invite you to take this uh, into your heart and into your life today, and certainly uh, in the days to come. We'll receive that blessing now. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and grant you his peace now and always. Amen. Thank you.